You guys good to go? Cool. Um, everyone, can you hear me down the back all right? Yeah, perfect. Uh, so thanks for coming to the new JavaScript Wellington meetup. Um, 1.0.0, we're sticking to Semper. Uh, it's been a, a long road to get to this. Basically what's happened is the Node.js meetup's grown to bigger than Node itself, and the Wellington.js meetup was uh, becoming unmaintainable by its current uh, organizers, mainly because they're CTOs of companies that are taking off and skyrocketing and have zero time. Um, so myself and a few other people in the community who I'll mention soon have taken over and we're running this, trying to run it as regular as possible. Um, but we're back and it's going to be awesome. We've got talks lined up uh, quite a few months in advance. So yeah, uh, first I'd like to give props to a few people. Um, one of them is BizDojo and I'm going to hand it over to DK over there to give us a quick rundown on what the BizDojo is, the Collider and the space. Um, hey guys, welcome. This is Biz Dojo. If you've never been here before, this is the largest co working space in New Zealand. There are about eight, uh, sorry, 800. Wow, I'll be so <laughs> working out here at the moment. There's a much bigger space next door, so you might appear through. Um, so, this is a co working space, so we do ask you not to go wander at the end of this event. Just because people are still working here, a respectful, and, and respect it as a co working space, and people will be have a head down on things. So, please respect that and walk wander. Um, I'll be around if you need a tour at any stage. Now, Collider is a program I run, and I'm an activation manager here. I got funded in the next three years to run a, a program called Collider, which focuses on the digital, creative, and tech community within Wellington to grow it. Uh, hence why we can support something like this and make it free uh, so people don't have to pay for access to this space, to the event space, which we're really keen to support growing meetup groups because that's where the good stuff happens for me. The community is knitted and amazing wisdom is shared and things happen, right? So I'm going to do the boring stuff then get out of your way. Toilets are at the back if you haven't found them already. The wire exits to the way you came in and to the left hand side before you exit this uh, space is another wire exit and you'll end up on Vivian Street. Exits next door, you just got to pull that door apart so you're pretty covered in terms of wire exits. Or just see me out with the one running. Um, there is drop, hold, and cover, and I'll direct you out if there's any shakes. And apart from that, I think that's it. Any questions about the legitimacy of the space and safety and anything else? Good. Welcome. Stick around. Have a great time. And it's welcome to you guys for organizing this. And thanks. So, cheers. All right. Thanks, DK. Um, second, props to Catalyst. They've come on as a, as a gold sponsor. So, they're keen to see the JavaScript meetup grow. Um, and they're a great place to work. They're always hiring JavaScript developers. So if anyone's in need of a job, go talk to Catalyst. Uh, specifically, Jen is sitting right there. So you can probably just tap her on the shoulder and have a chat. We're also looking, we're actively looking for more sponsors. So we'd love to see this grow into a sustainable meetup where we can afford to have pizzas and drinks every meetup. Um, so if you're working for a company or if you want to personally sponsor us, come chat to myself or any of the other helpers, which are these fine people. So Anna and Craig are unfortunately not here. Ryan and Michael. <laughs> uh, so we've had a few sicknesses, but we've got an awesome team to help us run these events. If you want to give talks or if you want to see any particular talks, just chat to these people or myself and we'll try and arrange that. Community notice board. Um, first off, we got Jen. Um, so, the chat. Do you need to use the mic or am I okay? I'll just hold it here. Okay. Hi, everybody. So, as uh, Silex already mentioned, I'm Jen, I'm with Catalyst. But more important for you guys right now, I'm the director of the uh, JavaScript conference that's happening here in Wellington next March. Now, if you haven't heard about that, 
go check out the website, it's conference.javascript. I'll make sure a link goes up in the comments of the meetup afterwards. This is a new event for New Zealand, um, and it's organised um, by myself and some of the folks um, that are part of the JavaScript New Zealand Society. To you run, we're aiming for real low cost, two day, two track event, and I'm going to be pushing a quick papers live towards the end of this month. Now, what gave me the confidence to go into this event, great content in it, was coming to these meetups over the last few years and seeing the real fantastic talks here at these local meetups. And I know that the Auckland meetups and the other meetups around the continent as well. So I'm really hoping to get great content from all of you. Experience to speak, it's great for your professional development and we can all share knowledge um, at that event. Uh, I'm also going to be looking for people to help run volunteer and some other bits and pieces. Um, and there'll be more details on the website as we start making announcements as we get a bit closer to the date. 9th and 10th next year. Uh, so save the date. Oh, and if your company feels like being a sponsor, we're definitely looking for sponsors. So let me know. I think that's all for me. Cool. Thanks. Um, website's up there, and it's probably going to be the theme of today as we're looking for sponsors for a lot of things. Uh, so the next one is we've got a NodeBots event coming up. It's on the 29th, I believe, of this month. NodeBots hyphen New Zealand. You'll be able to. They're $15. If uh, you need a bit of help, if you're cash strapped, there are free tickets available if you scroll right down the bottom of the screen. Um, but it's an awesome day. We host it on a Saturday. It's a day-long event from 10 to 4. You can pop in and out. But we build robots. We build amazing things. We have a bunch of hardware. Arduinos, Spark, Cores, Photons, Spheros, Drones, big, big six-wheel drive, mini Mars Rovers, just a lot of fantastic gear that anyone can pick up, program, hack with, and play with. So if you want to go to that, Check out that website. There's also a meetup group that I've started that helps with that. Um, and now we hand it over to all of you fine people to say any community notices. Is anyone hiring? Is anyone firing? Like, do we want to know about that? <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone looking for work? Uh, yeah, hiring companies? No. Catalyst, remember, talk to Jen. Uh, any, any contractors out there looking for work, employees? What a quiet bunch. Um, any community notices? I see that uh, there's a new package manager in town. It's the finest on the block. Anyone using it? Uh, Maybe in six months. Maybe in six months, yeah. Perfect. So the, the last thing is uh, make sure you join the discussion on Slack. So if you aren't aware already, we now have a JavaScript Society of New Zealand that helps build all of these things that you're seeing come into fruition, like NodeBots and the, Node co the JavaScript conference and this meetup, uh, all are helped with thanks of the society. Um, so if you want to participate in the society and see where we go, what direction we take, jump into the Slack and you'll find out more information from there. There's a GitHub issues board where we, anyone can post issues about what they think the society should be doing or ideas, and we will talk about those during the society meetings. Uh, that's it from me. I'm going to hand it over to our lovely speakers. So we've got Amelia and Gareth first with seven API learnings. Number four will shock you to your core. Hello. Oh, is it just for that? That's for the live viewers. Hello, live viewers. Oh, yeah, we're live streaming this, by the way. So if you jump on YouTube, you can see it. I might even give the, the, the live audience a view of you audience. <coughs> it's disappeared. Sorry. I've got...
I promise I had this ready, and it then it's disappeared. All right, let me get this one up. So whilst I'm just getting this ready, um, give you a little bit of background about myself. So I'm Amelia. Um, I work at Trade Me in the API team. And I've been there coming on about two years. So Trade Me is a .NET um, backend. So I work mainly in C Sharp, a little bit of VB. Cool. So I have a disclaimer. I don't write JavaScript currently at work. Um, I have in the past, though. Um, yes, yeah, so just going right of the way, uh, this speech will be from a server side what you can do with APIs for JavaScript. If you're writing JavaScript today, you're going to be using an API. It's pretty much unavoidable. You've got single page apps, you've got Angular, heavy front ends coming out. So my point of view is from how we can make things faster and better for the front end. And then Gareth will give the client side. That's how many requests we serve a week at Trade Me. It's half a billion. I think we account for 80% of local traffic within New Zealand. So, uh, and that's an API alone. So our API has to be pretty fast. <clears throat> so that works out to be 71 million a day. And this is the median. This is going to be a lot higher. So that's Sunday, Monday night. So that's 3 million an hour. 50,000 a minute, 100 a second, but at peak, it's getting on for three or four times more. That's a lot of requests. <clears throat> and a little bit of a breakdown of what our current API looks like. So the big one, oh, I didn't just cut it off. This is our iOS app, which is now universal. So in Apple land, that means it's for a tablet, iPad, and iOS. And then Android is our second biggest consumer. Uh, Touch is our current mobile built-in backbone. Thank you. And that's currently what we're going through trying to um, replace at the moment. And then the other ones are made up for other, which is random developers who have got API access that we've allowed them to. And then this is our new preview. I don't know if you've tried to go to Trade Me on your phone, you will have seen our new preview website, which will be our replacement. And then property. So I'm quite happy to say that in one month today, our API will be six years old. So I've told the team we need to have a party. <laughs> so yeah, that was created in 2010. Uh, a guy called Nick Parfini wanted an iOS app for Trade Me, and we didn't have an API. So rolling. And not long after, we had an Android app added. And less than two weeks later, we got our mobile website up and working because if you try to use the Trade Me desktop on your phone, it's pretty horrendous. And yes, we've got property apps as well. And then in 2014, so for about, bring myself up on this microphone. Uh, about two years ago, they decided to replace the desktop and task we've been slowly working towards. That then became this notion of API first. So everyone working at Trade Me needed to be building new features in the API, not just putting them into the website and forgetting about the API. <clears throat> and now I like to coin the term we're API only. No new features in the desktop. Everything must go into the API. Uh, so we, at the moment, account for 95% of all of our API traffic, we being our own apps and only 5% coming from elsewhere. With <clears throat> the replacement of desktop, it's going to be an even higher percentage. And that is going to cause a lot more, uh, no, higher number of requests per second, and a lot more caching and performance to think about. <clears throat> so that's our current architecture. We've got, ideally, all our business -y and data stuff going on here. 
again, ideally, thin API layer, not always the case. And then our apps, and, and this is the bit which animations work. We will be replacing it with an Angular front end, which is the preview I was mentioning, which will also disappear. <clears throat> And as I mentioned earlier, with JavaScript being king of the browser, like we have a lot of problems to face. Uh, we have duplicated information, so we still have all of these. We've got information in each of those, which is the same. How, how do you display this logic? How do you, because um, we've got some weird business rule, every single front end has to handle that currently. So that, that is one thing that we're working towards stopping. <clears throat> also running a lot of JavaScript with a lot of API calls to replicate our whole desktop is really slow on old phones. On 3G, you've got to think about people's data. You can't just be like, oops, sorry, accidentally gave you too many megabytes of data. And also our existing endpoints might be less relevant for our new front end. An example I'll go into more detail a bit later is we're now going to have a home page that needs to be served up through the API. How do we go about determining how do we do that? It's involved. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are my following ideas, views, and things that we have seen help us and potentially could help us in the future. So our API is restful. It's intended to be restful. I'm not sure anyone can 100% do rest. I was recently at API days last week. For media, you're not doing rest. So we're not doing rest. Uh, so we, we try and just keep resources as resources. That's our main, you know, adding new things and editing them. But again, back to the home page, sometimes you need to be pragmatic. And sometimes you don't want all of the data, or you only want to update certain pieces. Really restful. You're going to do a get of your listing. And then maybe, oh, there's a typo in my title. You go and edit the title. And you've got to post all that data back. Well, put. And that's a lot of bandwidth just to fix one, one tiny typo, which the website wouldn't have enforced you to do. That would have had some kind of RPC method in the, um, the ASP.NET. So patch is obviously uh, an option. Any implemented patch, we just started looking at it, and it's hard. It's not just, here's the email address, here's the update. It's his email address. Am I replacing it? Am I deleting it? Am I adding to a list of email addresses? And then that logic has to be applied everywhere that you allow a patch. So it's definitely an option thought about with allowing that in your API. <clears throat> Sometimes we have added single endpoints, which only update your email address. And they're very verby as opposed to nouns. Go and do this thing, .json. Would prefer not to. We already do have some things which do that, which we can't remove. Sometimes, oh, Slack going on. But sometimes, again, pragmatism is key. And although my, my inner API restful heart breaks sometimes, <laughs> when you compare your, your business value towards this change, it might actually be the, uh, <clears throat> so this is an example of what our homepage looks like in the new preview .trade me, um, on desktop. That's a lot of resources. Like you've got notifications, which of course could be separated out into some kind of external service. You've got my trade me, that's who you are, what your balance is. And then all of these stripes are going to be different resources, different searches, different requests, and so on. I think we've probably got going on down there. So that's a lot of asynchronous calls. 
for the front end to deal with, which Gareth will go into a bit more later. But how, how can we ideally make this a new endpoint, which goes, give me all of the things from my homepage? these four things, these six things, these six things, but it's not very reusable, whereas, of course, doing your seven calls is reusable and you can choose what you do as a client, but it's a lot of payload as well. One thing we have thought about doing is implementing hypermedia for almost metadata. So here, as the client, you want to get a list of your homepage, what homepage endpoints. There's not an endpoint which returns everything. It's an endpoint which returns a list of endpoints that you should now go and hit. So it doesn't get around the, the payload and the asynchronous number of calls, but it does help in removing logic from the client, which goes, I need a watch list, and I need a hot listings and a cool listings and this and that. So it takes that away from the client and puts that onto the server. No old phones. The more logic you can put on your server, the better. And performance, of, yeah, with performance comes caching. And a few things we use is caching and e-tags. So caching on the server can be severely impacted, or even just the server, let alone the client. It's peak if our latency, I think, sometimes our 95th percentile. So only 5% of users will experience that. It can be over 10 seconds. And that brings with it a lot of problems. Libraries are going to do retries. And if those libraries have bugs in them and those bugs do retries on post requests, it's a big can of worms and <laughs> to fix that. So for things such as tokens, JWT, OAuth tokens, with every request, you have to send those. You have to hit the database. And as soon as your peak time hits, you've got so many database checks isn't changing very often just to find out who owns this token. So for us, caching at the database layer, that goes down, like that's mission critical. Whereas we do have certain technologies which we can be like, broken, but it's not mission critical. <clears throat> uh, and we also have some in-memory stores, uh, such as Redis, things like the number of items in your shopping cart, and also your rate limits in the API. And again, they can just be turned off. It's not the end of the world. If we do lose the data that's in memory, it's the, um, the database pressure. So I hadn't actually heard about e-tags until I started working at Trade Me. So, oh, and they stand for entity tags, by the way. You, uh, an example. So we use this for data which doesn't change very often. Things like our category tree. We don't add that many new categories until Apple brings out a new iPhone. Often we rechange them. And so on your, on your get as the client, you can download, in this case, it's HTML. We'll return this e-tag number, and that's a hash representing the body that's been returned, and that's been turned into a hash. So the next time the client needs to retrieve that data, this through in your headers, and the, okay, take that hash to take the new data. So the server still has to do the work. It still has to go to the database or the cache. And the body, if, if the hash matches. And so this can say, I mean, our category tree at TradeMe is huge. So now instead, next time you send that through, just get back a content length of zero and a 304 not modified. So the client, hopefully, has already cached all this information. They can keep it in the browser and just keep reusing it. <clears throat> so yeah, this is an example of instead of having all of those resources before, we don't have to, every single time you refresh the page, you go back and forward. We don't have to go get all of the categories again. This is one of my favorite quotes. I don't know if you've heard the original one. I think it was there was only two things hard in programming. But cache and validation is hard. If you think about trade me, especially for simple CRUD apps, it's not too hard. 
when you update your name, you probably only update it in one place. Whereas the things which can happen in Tremi happen in admin, they happen through the API, they happen through the web, will be done in one basic layer. But it's, it's not always that easy, I guess, is my main takeaway. <clears throat> so something we're currently looking at implementing is shaping. And I try to find a GIF of someone dancing funny, but no. Bundling and shaping can allow us to either bring back more specific data, bring back data in a different shape completely that the client already wants, and they don't have to go through any logic of, I think, for example, our front end at the moment would like all of our fields to be lowercase. And so that's a lot of a lot of work for the client to have to do to, to go through every single request and lowercase every response. Things like GraphQL can offer us that, uh, something that we're only tentatively looking at at the moment. Um, at API Days last week, we saw called um, Barack Chamo talking about how they've used GraphQL and problems arise from it. If you can go give me the users and the, the sellers lists, sale items, and the people that are watching that, and so on, you've got this almost cyclical dependency. And, you need to be really careful about the depth of which you allow people to, to enter your, your graph. Thus, in five minutes, if you made a lot of concurrent calls during that depth of um, interrogation. <clears throat> Bundling, we could get everything together. So rather than going async, 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 go to one endpoint and go give me some of this. And the server does the, the async stuff effectively, and it pushes it one level up. So that this now just becomes one resource. There's no waiting on the client for seven things to load. And how do you know they've all loaded? But um, server handle, and again, I've, we, we don't implement this. This is just a very theoretical option that we, we definitely want to look into. How does the server handle bad requests? What if you've typed in a resource name wrong? Do I 400 on, on one sixth of your request? Do I ignore it? And those kind of things are, are the things that we're, we're up against. And no one, I guess, can come up with a, a clear idea of what's right, what's wrong. I don't think anything is necessarily right or wrong. Again, the word pragmatism is definitely, definitely your friend. <clears throat> Shaping, as I touched on earlier with GraphQL, this could really help us. Uh, do I have an example? For example, here, the watch list. How many bids are on the watch list on, on that item? Um, I don't need to know a lot of things. You know, we've got where, where the seller lives, what the seller's feedback is, whether you need to be authenticated to buy it. All of these things, I can't display to you in that tiny little box. So with shaping, that would give you the ability to be like, OK, give me a lowercase ID only one image, and the price. <clears throat> Number four, you won't believe it. Couldn't actually come up with a really good, unbelievable thing. Uh, but business rules. Again, this was uh, an alien concept to me, I guess, before I started trading. I was like, what, what is that? I can't go to the toilet without asking to go? Like, what, what does this mean? And they're just logic, I guess. You. You can't bid on someone's item if you've been blacklisted. And we've got a lot, so, so many business rules. And they can be pretty dirty, pretty messy. You don't even know why you've got them sometimes. And they've been added a lot over the years. Think business rules in VB in SQL store procedures. We have a store procedure which is more than 14 meters long. <laughs> like, it's longer than our long slide in our building. Someone printed it and rolled it down. Like, no one, that's why we started building new things rather than editing them. Like, it's, it's just nuts, some of it. Um, and deep database triggers. Again, you're trying to find out where this thing is being inserted into the database, and you have no idea that there's a trigger that lives on that different table. That, yeah. So putting those all in one central location really, really helps. Uh, 
if not, uh, there's less duplication. You don't have to have an iOS team that maybe doesn't talk to the Android team all the time to find out that differently. And then people are switching from their phone to their desktop and experience. And I guess that's where user experience also comes in. It's not just caring about the performance and things like that. And if you put your business roles in your desktop, which we definitely, definitely have done a few times, what happens when we kill desktop? Have those roles anymore? There's definitely a few I want to leave in there that I don't think we should carry with us. But Yeah, I have, I have no words to describe how, how hard it is sometimes to, to figure out whether you should be keeping it, what you should be doing. Whereas if you started off that way in the first place, no problems. And the, those, those dirty, dirty hacks that you put in that we'll just throw this in here and it will disappear one day. Like I've written them and I. Sometimes I was led to believe they would go away, and sometimes I went in knowing that they were not going to be removed. Uh, things to stop certain versions of an Android app calling a certain endpoint because of some weird bug. Um, and that is the great thing about using JavaScript, is that out in the wild, it's in my pocket. I've got to go to the app store to update it to get your fix for that bug, which made me buy 10 things instead of one. The user is downloading it from the server every time they go to it, or unless it's cached, hopefully not. But yeah, you can you can fix bugs as soon as they're out there. <clears throat> so the client will have to do. Sorry, that does not make sense in English. The more you can put into the API, the better. The client will have less to do. It doesn't have to worry about these business rules. But sometimes the hardest bit is figuring out what's a business role, what's a UI role, and where those two cover over. Should I be putting a bullet point in the API so that the JavaScript knows to render a bullet point and the iOS can render a star and whatever else you want? But don't do in your API, please, please do not put HTML in your API. Gareth? Hi, I'm Gareth. Um, I think this is for the people watching, so let's try and get someone right in one go. All right, I really hope this isn't making some horrible rush, rushing sound um, to the people listening. Um, so I'm Gareth. I've been working at TradeMe for about 10 months. Um, but And so when this talk being about APIs, um, let's look over the last kind of three years of the work that I've been doing. Um, so I'm currently working on a all Angular, soon to be Angular 2, stack. Um, I am no longer a front-end dev, which means that when we do things like ask for changes to our API or ask questions, I go to someone like Amelia, um, but I'm not on the other side of the fence. I'm no longer digging through .NET code or writing SQL. I, was doing, I did a project for KiwiBank for about 12 months. Uh, it was an internal back office application, Angular and .NET developers, uh, and Ministry of Education, that was a team of about um, six people. Again, 12 months, uh, that was Durandal, um, Knockout and a .NET backend. So, this um, when I was got in touch about this idea of let's talk about API learnings, and I was sort of I was sort of picking up these nuggets that I wanted to share. Um, it was kind of important that I, and looking at Amelia's slides as well, categorize my thinking in terms of all the th advice any of us could give you. Answers are the right answers depending on um, is this a public API, meaning um, whether that's the Facebook, YouTube, or Trade Me one, uh, you get a developer ID token and rate limited, so at a much lower rate, um, call it anonymously. Probably some terms of service, but ideally, Trade Me would love it um, for each and a, each additional developer who came on to build something for the ecosystem. By and large, uh, we, Trade Me, would love you to come and have a go with our API and, and have a crack at it. Um, it was a good thing. It's a public API. And to the private APIs, so in, in the case of KiwiBank, this, there was this idea that we were making an app with intended reuse. Uh, they were moving into a pattern of um, 
uh, microservices, and we kind of knew who the second client would be. So we had to leave behind something documented. But the thinking behind it was still um, there'll be a known list of people with a certain amount of trust um, organization. And then if we get down to like quite often a simpler API, just that the general need, um, if you are the person making your API and the client and there is no intended reuse, um, some of that thinking around what makes a good API, um, is this advice I should be following, uh, the things that are good answers for that are different. Cool. So we're cool with this idea. Um, so for TradeMe, we have a big public API. Technically, we do have some private endpoints. QBank was this idea that um, we were going to make something for internal use, got reused. Ministry of Education, um, we were kind of the only client to one of our APIs, and in a separate part of the app, we did have a public one. And um, shout out to them. Um, normally, we poke fun at government organizations, but the, the history of that API, this was like the fourth iteration. Like, there was a previous one that was SOAP. There was a previous one that was, I forget exactly what the language was, and then there's a previous one that was like batch file um, processing. So if we're talking about the ability for two systems to integrate, like, they have history going back to, I think it's 99, integrate. And the, the reason why we like that is because you can have a monolith that tries to do everything, one job, and they wanted a whole lot of other software to integrate with it. And that way you go from having, you can't propose monoliths to, to schools, essentially. This isn't Novapay, by the way, not involved. <laughs> and they're clear, like, I'd like to still be hireable. Like, I'd, but I'm actually hire one to bury on your CV. Um, <laughs> but, but the idea that other people had these, these management systems, and if you can, you can make some kind of contract to connect, um, I, I shout out to them for, for doing that way back in 99. So um, this is just a, a handful of things that I've sort of learned I thought you might enjoy. So um, who, who wants to sort of point out what I think is wrong with this, this example here? Maybe. Um, so, so, so possibly um, it might be debounced. It might sort of wait 300 milliseconds before it calls it. Um, maybe it should, like some of the things, maybe it should wait three characters before it starts trying to return meaningful data. Cool. Um, can anyone else spot what I don't like about this page? I assume we've all written some kind of um, templating language, uh, whether it's handlebars, Angular, Backbone, whatever. Yes? We're all familiar with it. I'm, I'm from an Angular world, but we're equivalent with the uh, an if statement, ng if or ng show. And quite often, particularly if you're coming from a sample, and uh, there's some kind of like a um, blah.has data wrapper property or like um, a blah.results.length. Um, my problem with this is every idea. You either do or you don't have data. And what's happening in this case is something starts where indeed they've, they've successfully cleared the data or there is no data. Data arrives and then we show the data. But, uh, but as a result, we show that temporarily. We show like if I, if I type in absolute garbage, I assume I would triangle exclamation mark, I'm sorry, no results. And the reason I bring this up is, is partly to, to bring forward this idea that um, in the async world, the data return is not binary. Um, there's kind of four states I'll go through. But what I like about this is I keep seeing this in production apps. Like when I use the Azure management portal, I was seeing this for the, the VMs I hosted, like go to a new screen, you have no data, I'm sorry, split second later, here's all your VMs. Um, Facebook and one of the updates on the, the phone, um, I opened it up and it says, in order to see content, um, please subscribe to pages or add some friends things. And then like, boom, then like my nine years of history on Facebook is, is there. Um, I keep seeing this. So, and as we sort of go through, all right, well, what should we be doing about um, data that is in the process of loading that could be very quick, uh, could be very slow. It's obviously usually very quick in your dev environment. We can give someone a white page. Um, I think if you, uh, an HTML site as a, as a newbie um, with some sort of server load and then push it live uh, with no optimization, quite probably there'll be some point of, you know, um, I think there's a fancy acronym, like the, the amount of time the white screen will show before some kind of Chrome loads. So we could give this experience, but I want to move on beyond that. Pro showing a loading thing is the introduction of a third state, right? Um, so what do you do? You request the data, uh, you say that the state is loading, and then once it has loaded, then you can go into this, I have data or I don't have data state. Um, kind of it's old as time, right? People appreciate being told about the system state of the system. Uh, but also, if this thing sort of goes on for like 20 odd seconds, it's still annoying as it was 20 years ago. What I like is this new pattern where we show a placeholder that is similar. It gives some sort of confidence that we sort of know that we're going to bring you back something. So in particular, in both examples, remember they've rendered Chrome, right? We don't get the white screen anymore. Like the app says, like, I'm not 
got some part of the progress. And I think something along these lines is a, is a great thing to have, to show some kind of confidence. And what I, I love about the Facebook experience is, is these things are like crack. Your phone goes off, right? You get that one notification, and it's that mysterious, like you have one, one notification, you might have to go in to see what it is. And quite often, it's, it's absolute garbage. Like I've got pages I haven't maintained for years, and they're like, your page has one new view. It, it could be a message. Um, it could be a friend request. Who knows? But if, if you're on a slow phone, and you've, there's a limited number of connections that can go through, a limited number of processing, if you can load up those little crack rocks, like those those things that sort of display it. One idea we toyed around and, and uh, trade me was, let's just at least put the title on the screen. Like, let's show them that we know that we're partly there and then we've got a whole lot of other processing and stuff to do. But the, the title is one example, telling someone that they've got some notifications and you'll get there eventually. I think it's a really great thing. Um, do I have another? And lastly, um, just remember there's the error state. Um, the other sort of trap you can fall into is the, um, you know, sure enough, you can make a button that shows like a loading spinner. Um, Say the cell phone carrier is totally at fault. You didn't write any bad server code. Um, showing someone a remaining loading spinner, if you've ever watched someone else using it. Um, I've done it myself, like thinking a bit slow. Um, if once, once the connection's dead, like let someone know, like have some kind of a fallback, whether or not you're just using the, the red pop-up toaster, don't, don't leave them hanging on a loading state. Don't show them a no data state. So the way I'm going to summarize that is play asynchronous games, win asynchronous prizes. Cool. Uh, let's get on to bundling and multiple requests. So this is uh, the, the preview homepage. And on the preview homepage, we show you various samples of content. And if you're logged on and you have some stuff on your watch list, we'll show you that first. We will show you um, some auctions that I think have been picked out as being cool. We'll show you some auctions that have been identified as having quite heavy bid activity. Uh, we've got some things that are just simply closing soon and other flavors. So as of right now and as of this, this app's history, uh, once the app's loaded, we make three separate asynchronous calls and we display the starter once it's ready. So to the room, tomorrow, should we tomorrow um, make some way of bundling it? We probably can't go full blown with GraphQL or ODAT or anything, but should we make a bundling call to only make one call and not three or possibly seven? Bundling, come on. Take, 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 a, take a risk, take a guess. Bundling, yes. What do we got? Um, I think I'm actually I'm going to touch on that, but I think the idea is if we were to change it tomorrow, put HTTP two tomorrow. But it's, it's a good answer. Anyone else? Anyone want to go against? Anyone else want to go for? Um, I, I want to sort of throw a sideways thing, and I want to, I want to say measure. Um, what you'll find, what I've often found is if someone wants, wants to make the performance argument, like performance is key, what about the guys on the cell phone, of which incidentally is I think over half our traffic now, um, by all means, talk about it. Um, my, my personal thing about bundling here is um, I, I like the resourcefulness of REST. Like I have other issues around some of the pedanticness of it, but I think to make an ad hoc bundle is sort of a step in the wrong direction. Um, I like HTTP2, the idea that we lower the overhead of making those three calls. Um, and I'll touch on the, the bundling in a bit. But um, maybe, maybe that's not the issue. Like we've done measure, measuring and sort of finding out the part of the render time slow. Um, obviously the, the thing where we dug into the caching around e-tags, we've looked into that. We've looked into storing stuff into local storage that when you do load up, we know at least you know, what was in your watch list previously. Um, if, if you've got those measurements, like someone wants to say, yes, we should bundle it, get, get the measurement, like how long is that? Uh, what is it, how long does it take on a slow phone on 3G to make seven um, requests after the app is loaded. Uh, it's with that data that you can move forward. So always be measuring and data beats opinions. Uh, part of a book club recently, we um, read uh, how Google works. And it was kind of crazy. At one point, they really dig into how much they rely on data. Um, they have this thing where, as they make decisions, they've got all the data. I think they often have two screens in their little conference rooms. And that one of them will always have the data. They talk about the hippo, um, the highest highest income person in the room or something thereabouts. You know, it's not seniority that wins an argument, it's data. Sort of contemplating um, these fancy tricks to improve your app, um, start with the data. So um, here are some questions about, do we make additional calls? So on a listing, um, incidentally, this is like a, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a title and there's pictures and there's things about money and people. But we can, we can ask a question and answer. I, I say that because it's, it's not a separate page. So I can type in a question. 
questions asked, I can then put it into this display. And then with dynamic rendering like Angular, um, I could do it right, right there and then, right? I don't actually need to talk to the server yet. I can display this because I have all the templates, and then I can send the message to the server. Or I can send the message to the server, get back the full list of question and answers, and then re-render it based purely on what the server said and not the data that I already had. So who thinks I should do what? Who thinks that I should um, just go ahead and display it anyway and then talk to the server? Cool, uh, about a third of the room. And who thinks that I should send the data to the server and only display what the server told me was true? Anyone? Interesting. What about in this case? Um, I'm going to place a bid on a faulty camera for $100. Should I um, show them that the thing has happened immediately and then talk to the server and do my reconciliation? Or should I send the bid to the server and then act on only the information the server gives me? So who says I should, kind of like last time, who says I should, that their bid has gone through successfully immediately, then talk to the server? And who thinks I should send it to the server and only send what the server gives me? Um, we go through examples similar to this regularly. And my, my general feeling is um, reliability and dependency, uh, dependability is key. Uh, I would say it probably trumps performance. Um, nothing good, like you mostly got the, the second one quite right. Um, nothing good comes from saying that you're in the lead of an auction and then like a page refresh shows that in fact someone else bid ahead of you and your one never went in in the first place. Um, so, I know that there was some talk earlier about you know the the perils of talking to the server, particularly on a slow loading uh, you know slow device. But by all means, absolutely do that, do that other call, even though it's going to drag other data with it. Like the, the most important thing is that, that users and you yourself can trust the data that's on the screen. And in the case of things like those those lighter weight ones, like the question, like maybe we could just put it in, maybe um, that's always right on the edge. Like we often find you can do like one or two changes to data you already have get it right, or you can probably get the outcome right, but you get to like three or four changes or variants, and that's when it's really like, actually just go to the server. Like You've made this interface, so you can call it again and again. By all means, get the data and make it reliable. Yep. Uh, yes, so, so we do that. Um, so quite often throughout our app, we'll sort of show um, an, uh, an action is in place. Um, this was more about if we went as far enough in ahead and said that, yes, your bid has been placed and you're in the list and you're in the lead, uh, it could be misleading because if someone else bids $100, that bid would get, your, the, this person's bid would get cancelled. Um, to give just a, sorry, a slightly parallel example, in Stack Overflow, I think they've gone with that um, display first, server second mentality. Um, if you upvote a post that is your own, it will show you the count going up, and then a second later, you'll see the little message saying you can't upvote your post, and it reconciles and then brings the vote count back down. Example of um, showing the outcome first, reconciling, and then um, fixing. In our case, particularly around bidding, um, any sense stuff like that, we will show the actions in progress and then show the result. Um, that data could be 30 seconds old, and you want to be told, um, and with it, bring like there's four people a bid, bid since, it's now $200, you're now going to need to bid 205 to, to be in the lead. Yep, so we, we always show something, something's in progress, um, it's just that we don't jump ahead, kind of like we could do with the question. Um, I'm going to quickly take a stab at OData. Um, does anyone here remember OData, or is um, GraphQL the new hot thing? OData, rememberies. So, so generally speaking, I'm going to categorize this that um, when we talk about APIs, we have resourceful endpoints uh, with known contracts. You can give certain properties and get certain things back. Uh, then there was a breed of um, kind of either it was either deliberately rapid application development or not. Um, or it was, yeah, the, the idea was that you could just point it at a SQL server and it would totally tell the person the schema and they could query whatever they wanted. And it, it, answers, it answers all these questions like, what happens if you only wanted a few fields? What happened if you wanted a listing and the people who were bidding on it and their names and their regions? Um, you could totally craft up these queries and not go through the development cycle quite so often. 
promised a whole lot. I looked into it in 2014. Um, and I, so you get these examples. Um, there's sort of this language, you know, you can say, I want airports, but I want to filter it by this property, location, San Fran. Build these one by one like you would normally. Um, I want to, I, guess I want to get people, but I want to expand the, um, where they've been. I'm sorry, only for the people who've been to a trip to the US, and I think bring the trips with them. Um, it, it seemed quite promising that we could kind of get our data layer for free. We, we, it, like just, it, it pretty much died at the first hurdle in terms of using it for a commercial app. Like, I kind of want to get this thing for free. I wanted to make sure it was using new technology. But the ability to limit the schema, um, the thing that you could get for free, um, uh, like all throughout the documentation at that time, and this is from the .NET, um, you got so much for free, but you couldn't touch it in the meantime. Like you couldn't stop it from looking at your admin tables. Um, apparently, a coworker sort of figured out where to go to do it, but it just wasn't part of that you know, that that work. I just didn't start of the pitch, and like that, that's just failing in the first hurdle. The second is um, there didn't really seem to be a clear way to to at least do one business rule, right? Um, and trade me, I don't think we can. Act, you can't publicly access a listing that's more than 45 days old. Just like the, the smallest of things, um, you know, someone posts, someone wants to um, ask, you know, so you, someone wants to ask for a list of users, but you want to make sure that you sort of remove certain things um, along the way. Uh, there didn't really seem to be much of that, and I haven't looked too much into GraphQL. And thirdly, is performance. Like I've seen kind of the, some of the crazy work that goes into getting a site to high performance, um, and so sort of, you know, some of the SQL tuning that goes on. So this idea that you can um, kind of sometimes get additional data joins or sometimes shrink, you know, the kind of fields that come back thinking that it's more performant. Um, those are the three things that seem to be the big stumbling hurdle. So back in 2014, this is kind of the reason why we just had to like get away from OData and have an opinion that we had deliberately not gone with it um, as it stood at the time. And as I hear more about GraphQL, um, I think it's quite cool. I don't think it's quite right for a public API, but I think Facebook has pulled off something very similar to it, maybe because they've got a smaller business domain. You know, they've got people and links to other people and pages uh, and posts and comments and pictures. Early on, we spoke about like, what's right for a public API. Um, I think some of that thinking, once you get down to the, the private within the, the enterprise, um, I think the idea becomes quite good. Um, if you've got a data store of interest rates, historical interest rate. I think something like this, like a public endpoint where you can kind of query things like a little bit willy-nilly and performance isn't that critical um, and volume's not going to be that crazy. I think making that, that data public um, through a technology like that will be one day be amazing, but I wouldn't expect um, many of the public, particularly like the larger business domain things, to really take that on. Prove me wrong, but cool. Uh, now on to my favorite point, um, which will take a couple of twists and turns. Um, but I hope it makes sense. So, years of uh, being an API consumer and at times an API maker, um, I have had to sometimes sort of split personalities. And I'm going to sum this up that think of yourselves, um, if, if you were the person making both the client and, and the server end, think of yourselves as neighbors and not bunk buddies. Familiar with the movie? Um, and that sort of means like you have so much close proximity that you could totally keep bending things to the way you'd like them to be. You've got to really resist that temptation and you've got to keep asking um, what is good for the server and what am I really doing with the client? Like, um, is this a reusable endpoint or am I just totally bent sure of what I want to render on the screen and just taking that thought and mapping it directly to the server? There will be cases where maybe it's a good idea. You might have to make three to four calls to a server to sort of restfully deal with a problem and then sort of cartooning like a very particular resource to a very particular job. Just remember that you're, you're very much suiting the API to suit, suit this one client that you're making at that one time. Um, that, that sort of that separation is quite good. Um, it'll, it'll definitely happen more down here, and then up in the public sort of sphere, you have to worry more about you know who are these people who are going to be using it, and would we serve them enough? Of the the years that I've spent, particularly when I was doing the server side part, bend around this line, like what what belongs to the app within the boundary of the API. I mentioned that rule. Um, back that's older than 45 days. So if we want to make a, if we want to have that sort of going on these four, you know, um, Apple, Android, Angular apps, should, should those apps know um, that you can't get something older than 14, uh, 45 days? I'm going to wager you want to get as close to no as possible. Um, 
by all means, let them look up a listing by ID, uh, but then sort of, you know, use your, use your 404s, 40 whatevers to sort of say, oh, 302s, um, you can't view that resource. I'm sorry, here's the message that that thing's expired. Um, possibly if you're letting somehow someone filter over date ranges, like maybe it'll creep into the client. Like they, they can preempt you and tell you, no, you that far. But, but ideally as possible, you want to start with the idea that the client should be quite dumb. You know, if you're bidding, send the message through. You can possibly anticipate the kind of areas that you'll get back. You might want to make some decisions around that. But by all means, try and beef up the, those business rules and that's the sort of area. And, and try not to let all those wacky little, like, display this, display that things, try not to let them build up an excess on the side. Uh, the one exception, though, is if you decide to do something kind of unique, um, that people, I don't know, for some reason, it, it, you, you search, like, property and motors and jobs all at the same time, or you've got some sort of crazy way of viewing um, everything that's in the watch list. That's what I'm going to call a flourish. Um, the API does what it does, hopefully re represents things reasonably resourcefully. Um, and then over here, you've decided some sort of crazy implementation. And by all means, like, that, that's a decision that's made on this side of the fence. Um, go ahead, do it. Make, make cool stuff. Um, just remember that you need that separation. Um, if you build the API to look like the app you're making, it's very narrow, but you've got to support those other five people. So you ideally want to start with the, keep, keep um, advocating for a dumb client. <laughs> But absolutely, if you can find a good flourish and it, it varies from how the API presents the world, by all means, like, absolutely make that flourish, um, either possibly extend the API or make that second call, go crazy. This is where my story takes like a 90 degree turn. Um, this is some data from the Trade Me API and this is a story from 2011 uh, where there was a data visualization contest. In particular, I ran the Trade Me listing search for expired auctions and I plucked them out. Auctions. I was generally getting data about how much, where the sold things had gone to and from. So I was trying to figure out these things like between like Wellington and Hamilton, like what is the trade flow and can I split it by category? Or if I get into Wellington, like um, how many people are trading between like Pararoa and Upper Heart and Wellington City? It seemed like a cool idea that I could make to maybe colored line. And it was supported by the fact there was, there's an API that I could kind of sign up for pretty easily. I had to, um, there's a rate limit, and I had to like let it run and do it's like 600 queries and then pause for an hour and run again. But if you look at kind of what I needed, like, so, so you understand the concept, right? Um, you run a search and, you, and to get, to get all, to try and get all the data back, you had to do a search for like star E star and like run it till it kind of ran out. And then you run a search like star A star to tr just try and sort of like get all the listings you can because there's no real like search or listings endpoint for expired. But all I really needed was expired, right? Expired is true. Uh, I think some stuff around the price and some stuff to figure out, did it sell or not? Of all these fields, I think I only needed like four of them. And only about, at the time, 11 or 12% of things are listed on Trade Me Sold. So there's a massive amount of wastage. But my point is, I cared so much more about being able to do this than, than the wastage. So if you want to talk about, you know, like slowly slimming things down, like I say measure, like geez, it kind of shoes this problem away. Much more that I could do this. Um, that, that's the amazing thing about the API. That's why we make them. Trade Me, when it made the API, um, was could, could think supporting its desktop app, Android, iPhone, the upcoming web thing. They probably didn't, and they may have semi-anticipated someone trying to scrape sold data. Uh, incidentally, you can't do this anymore. You can't search for expired stuff. Um, <laughs> But, but the, the point was they put it out there because they wanted, like I said at the start, someone to turn up and try an idea. And this is an example of me trying an idea that they didn't fully conceive, and I'm totally happy to put up with the data waste. Like, there was a time when people sort of wrote trade me scrapers to sort of try and do things, and there was this mixed relationship. And if we, is anyone familiar with like when Twitter changed their API back in 2012? Um, so basically, um, what they sort of said was they didn't like people making Twitter clients. So I think if you've used Echofon, or what was the other popular one? Sorry, say later. Speak something, yeah. I'm not sorry, I'm not down with the, the Twitters that much, but um, they kind of said, Hey, um, if you're making making a Twitter client, we, we kind of want to be king. So they, they said indirectly, but said, We're only going to allow you to have a hundred thousand users on your system, and that, that really limited the, the growth potential of um, traditional Twitter clients. They really like put the boot in as they tried to um, look at other things like what can you do with an API? Like you think about Trade Me, um, this idea. So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, within Twitter, uh, there was this idea of clout, was this idea of like, it was still in the consumer space, 
but it was getting done to analytics. And absolutely, they, they were thumbs up. Clark, you're cool. Please keep doing what you're doing. Social influence ranking. Go away, Echo Phone. Please do that. Um, there's also some stuff at the business end that kind of do very aggregate reports. They'll do like real-time um, sentiment streaming. So something like the Super Bowl, they can totally tell you like the positivity and negativity of tweets um, as they happen. So this idea of um, people doing analytics in the business space, they were totally fine with. And I think even the Hootsuite, um, if you're a social media coordinator, um, they were totally fine with that. So in terms of broadening your thinking around why you would make an API, particularly in the public realm, and just just the kind of ideas people would come up with because you want them to you know, make this cool stuff. This is, this is an idea about broadening your thinking and then a business totally clamping down on one of them. And because it's because they were more trying to duplicate what Twitter already had and got on them, they're trying to do it better. But this trade me thing, if you think about what our iPhone app does and our Android app does and our Angular one, um, it's kind of like it's, it's the consumer engagement part. And if we think about, we bought a company called Tradevine many years ago uh, that basically did a very good job of letting businesses um, have a large inventory management system and kind of manage all of the comings and goings of that. So again, like broadening that thinking, like TradeMe wasn't even in that space. Um, they did a great job through the API and eventually TradeMe bought them. And I'm sure somewhere, kind of like me, um, I was trying to get into the analytics space. I was trying to drag out sole data and I'm sure someone has done the same thing for property, probably motors too, probably jobs. So am um, I doing extra time? <laughs> Um, I could sure do with a drink of water. All right, um, I read this book a while ago, and it was it was basically saying crowdsourcing is crowdsourcing is just brilliant, um, and they they gave thumbs up to wikis, etc. Um, but the kind of the you don't need to read it. Like I, I looked at this up just recently, and the, the reviews are kind of hovering around three and a half stars. But the point they make is um, in the old world of businesses, you really kept a hold of like the boundary of your thing you did, and you were quite careful about it. And you look at things like um, YouTube and Facebook, and I guess to a point Twitter. Like, how did they become successful? Successful. They decided, like, what was important to them, and they made an API, and they totally encouraged people to, to, to work with it. So in the case of YouTube, that they just really cared that eventually, you know, it spread. Um, there's a boundary about what they let you do. And the case of TradeMe, um, we, we're totally fine for, um, I think we're reasonably totally fine for, for listings to be displayed elsewhere to let other people find other ways to sort of sell things or view things on the site. But we still want to be at the center of it so that we can, you know, police it, make sure. Shill building, shill, should, sorry, phony bidding, bidding doesn't occur. So this idea that that's sort of the old business, decide what the core business strength they have to offer, and they keep offering the examples, Facebook being one, you know, that, that totally eclipsed everything else. Um, YouTube, massive growth. Google, again, massive growth. Um, they give one example of a gold mining company in Canada. Um, Normally, all of the, the history they have around we who kind of find gold was a big secret, but they just gave it out for free and said, hey, who wants to muck around with this? And, and people from weird scientific backgrounds like, came back to them with these answers from, from fields that, that had no relation to geology and was able to offer them sort of fresh data. Uh, it's not technically an API, but there's this thing like they decided, what do they, what do, they do? They're good at drilling into the ground. Got cool answers back. The result of sort of you know these APIs that have gone quite successful and you know that, that key uh, to integration, we look at things like Slack. You know um, the amount of stuff that you can get to come into Slack is kind of cool. And remember, Slack's a chat chat channel, right? We're not displaying like in Trade Me World, we're not displaying the full listing content of a Trade Me listing. You know, title and price. I think when a card moves in Trello, it's just like this card moved from here to here by this person. Simple data, simple fields, and, and compressing it. Um, and again. I think in the, in the Trello world, you know, you can hook up Trello to Slack and GitHub. Um, you fight JavaScript against Adobe Flash, and it just runs a thing. Google does with right? Google search. But as a result of the API, you can kind of just run two searches and look at, like, the total results, and then a whole new app is born. I think, I think that's kind of cool. Like, they didn't have to anticipate this was going to get made. They just made it available, and someone kind of came up with the idea. It would be fun to make for have fights this with the Google one, like they start with these things like I feel, I hate, I think, and it sort of shows like um, results, I think, that, oh no, sorry, from Twitter. Uh, I feel like I'm going to faint, be back later, I love you, Nikki. I feel what you feel, question mark. Um, I just think this is a cool concept. And again, they, they just made the tweets available, they let someone else come up with this concept, and now this exists. And, you know, Twitter's notoriety grows. And I once, in the same year that Alex came second, uh, sorry, first in a, in a competition, I came second-ish, um, won some money for scraping up YouTube data mixed with um, New Zealand's NEF funding. Again, this was part of a government initiative. Do I have another slide? 
to um, make data available. Um, anyone seen this website, been on here at all? Two. Cool. Um, so you, you kind of get the, the concept, just a little bit of back history. So you can go online and some of the government data is online, you can search it. And that's great. Some of some PDFs and uh, comma separated value files, uh, et cetera. But the cool thing is it started out because they realized that Parliament was spending a whole bunch of money on consulting. And they wanted to at least have a go at making the data publicly available and see what the public could do with it. Because it wasn't up to them to come up with the ideas. Um, they reckon they could get a whole lot more um, out of making it available and seeing what could be done. So there have been a number of pushes in that space. And as I said, um, Alex and I once won some money. It was nice. So I didn't quite know how to sum this one up. And I hope I haven't gone on too long. I didn't really time this I hope you're all right. Um, we need to have a break for water. Let's make that known. Um, I would kind of, towards as I went through that thing, um, I wanted just to say you can't predict the future. If you can make an API and kind of do like a reasonable job of like an interesting business domain, and it's kind of, it allows a bit of freedom, um, you know, in Trabe you can get you can get the listings and you can do the searches and you can sort of inquire about some of the members. In Google you can do searches, get videos. If you sort of let people at it, um, they will have their own ideas. And as a business, I'm sure if you know what your core strength is, right, you will do well out of that can't predict what that thing would be. Um, and the thing where I got the expired distance, I cared so much more that it's available. And the government cared so much more that the, the data could, was available for analysis than it not being available. Um, th those other conversations around, you know, the efficiency of the schema, et cetera, like th those you can deal with further down the track. But if you can get your data into that, in, in our world, API first, um, that is so much more powerful. Uh, and it's so much powerful. Uh, there is so much more room for activities. It had a narrow thing, old business. You sort of, you can at best, in our trade me world, maybe make a trade me client. But that broader thinking, I think, so much more room for activities. Cool, I'm just going to hand back to Amelia for one more story. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, Gareth. So that leads me really nicely onto this little anecdotal story that we tell at um, Tramie has boot camps for brand new devs that start um, every couple of months. And we go in and we're like, hello, with the API team and things. And once upon a time when the API was really open and anyone could get access, this, this guy started a little bot and he gave it a dollar a day. And then it would go and find the dollar listings and it would bid on them. And if it won, it would get delivered to his house. If it didn't win, they have two dollars and so on until it eventually bought something. So this guy would get like basins and bricks turning up to his house. And like we just think that's such an awesome way of can't predict the future. You can't predict what people are going to but they're definitely gonna build something awesome. And couldn't leave you without. We're hiring. We get bonus but bounty, not bonuses. That'd be nice. So hit us up if um, you're looking for JavaScript jobs, uh, SQL, .NET roles. It's going at the moment. Thank you. Um, we're going to quickly do a transition to get Tim talking. Um, so if you want to, that's fine. And um, also, just another point, uh, a GitHub repo listing a lot of New Zealand's different APIs, slightly in, content, uh, in contradiction of what the government were doing, but the government was focused on government, and I wanted all of government, including companies. Um, I've now handed that over to Figure. Um, so if you go to Figure's website, you can find it there, and it's an open list where you can add your own company's API to it. Um, and it's a great list to find just random data. It's it's a shame that they don't run mix and mash anymore because that was such a, a perfect example of crazy things that you get at experiences. Um, but now we're going to kick it over to Tim. So, oh, your talk is on test driven development is still alive. So, T TDD is still here and kicking. We have about five minutes to set up, so feel free to grab some pizza, go to the loo, have some water. Um, and I'll start talking loud when I start. Thank you. Do you want this set up? Um, yeah, just hold on. Yeah, just hold on there. Hello, 
probably will need to get you to move your computer though. <laughs> Oh, it's just the thing about Android, isn't it? Oh, like You have about an hour, so I'll give you like that five minute warning. Oh, okay. That's something I did my kids.
so thank you all for staying. Um, as Alex said, I'm Tim Wright. I'm with a company, there's three of us, we don't have much money, called RAP Global. We're basically going to make it so people don't have to do expense claims anymore, which I think is awesome. And that's probably enough about the company. We don't have a product you can buy yet. Um, soon we will. I'm going to do a number of different things. I've got the really low-tech slides here that one person can never copy off afterwards. I've also got an actual presentation. Um, there's lots of words on it, PowerPoint karaoke. And I've also got coding we're going to do. Because this is a development talk. We're going to talk about test development and React and TypeScript. It's actually to do it in front of you. Hopefully it works. I haven't done live coding in a presentation before, so it might all go to hell. In any case, it should be kind of fun. Anyway, the talk's going to be in two-ish parts. Um, detailed coding part of things. I've also got some on of a single page app. Last four months building a single page app for our company. Evolve using test driven development over those three or four months. So I'm going to go through where we've ended up, what makes sense, what I'd like to change. Finally, for a single page app that does lots of complex caching and things, people have done before. It's not going to be the best, most perfect design, but it's where we've got to at the moment. So there's two parts, a coding part and sort of a designy, chatty part, if that makes sense. I've no idea how long it's going to take, but Alex tells me I've only got about tells me I've only got about 50-ish minutes probably now. So test-driven de development of a single-page web app in React and TypeScript, or as I realise how many buzzwords I can get into the title. There's my LinkedIn profile. Feel free to add me. That's all good. I'll also let you in on a presentation secret. If you've got slides with lots of words on them, the first thing you should always do is turn around and read them. You no, know you have all as well. So, the first thing to answer really is why should we care about these three technologies? And they're independent technologies. TypeScript. When I first started programming in JavaScript, I used to do lots of really stupid errors. It's a callback in. Only I passed the function that called into the callback, the result of it, not a callback calling the function, if that makes sense. And I do that all the time. TypeScript just gets rid of that problem. This parameter of my method has to be a function. So if you accidentally call your function and pass in the result, it's not a function you're giving it, and TypeScript will complain. Little silly errors like that kind of go away. React, big web apps where you've got lots and lots of interactivity, those on-click events is tricky, especially if it's in a global namespace. React essentially um, componentizes everything, what you're calling your functions, and does lots of other cool things as well. We're going to go through React component as well. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's really powerful and lets you reuse code all the time. Driven development. So testing's lovely and good. TDD isn't so much about testing. Thinking about your code in advance so you can design it well. But anyway. It also means that I know my code works and I haven't made any stupid mistakes that I tend to make all the time. Result to a function to a callback. This is what we're going to do. So you read my slides. If you can imagine, or on lots of apps, you've probably seen a little text edit box. It has something on it like email address, and you click on it, start typing, and the words email address slide off up to the side or do something cool like that. So we're going to look at test driving or building that component. We're not going to look at the CSS or animations. Dominus, if that makes sense. It seemed like a sensible little component that's quite constrained and quite small. 
I'm going to build it. And then we're going to look at browser architecture of a single page web app as a nice sort of, if you're building a big thing like this in React, here's how you might structure some of your code. A framework for building your user interface. But in a single page app, there's a whole lot of other stuff that has to happen. Get there. Here's the text and, um, component that we're going to use. So imagine if when you're writing HTML, you can add new things into it, like text edit, instead of div and span and input and button and everything else we've got. You can specify attributes on your property, so hint text into your username. Changes. In this case, we're not going to do anything. And when the change is complete, so the user presses enter or does some other action like that, maybe they move their mouse away, blur or defocus the component, they're going to run this code. So here we're mixing up the HTML, text edit, XML-like tags, with actual JavaScript. So all of that trying to find the DOM node to attach your on-click event to, React does it for you, which is really quite nice. About attaching the wrong bit of code to the wrong DOM node. This is the interface to our component. So we're going to build the code that implements text edit. I should say, too, if you have any questions, right, just ask. My voice will have a chance to recover. Here's some TypeScript. And here are some stupid things we've done in the past. So TypeScript, here we're just defining something called my object. It's got a number of things with six and a list of things. TypeScript has lots of additional syntax you can use to define the types. A string or a number or other things. Here TypeScript is inferring the types. So when we try and do something like assign a value to a field that doesn't exist, and the code won't be transpiled to JavaScript. So you know straight away that you've typed num things instead of number of things. Okay, it's tracking down customer number versus customer num, which took me half a day before I started using TypeScript. TypeScript. Because even if you're unit testing your components, it's easy in unit tests to assume that your object has a certain structure, a certain shape, a certain way of writing number versus num. One component and assume something different in another and not realize until your code crashes in production. In assigning a string, that fails, which is lovely because you know something's going to be a number. And if you add two numbers together, you get another number. You don't do concatenation suddenly. Push the value five into an array of strings. Just won't work. Those are some of the benefits TypeScript gives you. When it's combined with React, this is kind of cool. Because we can say the hint text in our component, this has to be a string. And when I'm using the component, if I try and pass in a number, comp compilation will fail. I can't produce the JavaScript. If I forget to have hint text, because we've defined the type for what properties or attributes are valid, the program won't compile or get a compile error. All these little things with TypeScript can just help us use our React components a little bit better. Does that make sense so far? I've never used TypeScript. Yep. And uh, are you saying that the scheme that you're set is defined by your my object then, that it's by example? In this case, it is. TypeScript does the type inference. Okay. But you can also specify it yourself, like in this one I prepared earlier. This was sort of what I've, I've never used it, but this is what I've seen. Well, I use it. I don't tend to use the inferred types, because I like being precise. I like defining interfaces that I can then share between multiple files so that I know I'm using an object of the right shape.
Yep. Um, this, this is a Yep. Yeah. So you're right. The prop types thing that you assign to the class or function does a similar thing to what I'm doing here. Just TypeScript takes it a little bit further. In the interface text edit props, we're saying on change, the question mark means it's an optional attribute. Compiler won't complain. And then the code I write to the component has to handle it missing. On change complete takes another function. Fields are both functions that take a string and return nothing. And finally, the hint text is a string. And you're right. If you're using prop types, you'll have something similar to this, but probably not with the more detailed type information. So the string to on change instead of a function. Complain. Actually, it does. You're right, because you say react dot prop type dot function or object. Yes. Yeah. So you have to notice in the console. Um, here we have the component class extends react dot component, and we pass in the text edit props interface version of defining prop types. And also the state. Here we're going to have the contents as a string in the state. So React components have an internal state to themselves, and they can also get state from somewhere else that I might or might not talk about. At the moment, the, container, um, the component just returns an empty div tag. So does that make sense as the component definition? Writing a component, I'll write this kind of first without any structure or anything like that using it. Who has used Jasmine? Most people. So I use Jasmine. I think the syntax is similar to or whatever the other competing one is. What I found really useful in Jasmine is if you don't put any body for your test, they just come as, up as pending tests when you run Jasmine. When I start thinking about a component, it's just listing all the tests that I'm going to write. Write them, find other ones that I've missed right, because you never get anything first off, and find one's tests that didn't really. For React components, I tend to have two types of tests. Structural ones. Oh, I've got a mouse cursor. So my component has to have an input thing. And I want to be able to test that, check it's there. And here I'm going to say it has to have a div for that hint text as well. When the text box has contents, this class small hint to be added to. If I'm doing some funky stuff with animation, I may have some more tests around that as well. Behavioral tests. Does that all make sense? I've never tried typing with a microphone as well. Solution, I did do this last week, so. I know it should all be possible. So it contains an input component. What you should also see, because I'm using TypeScript, my IDE should do a whole lot more auto-completing than if you're not used to using TypeScript. And that's a huge advantage of it. Because the IDE knows my properties I can use, it can auto-complete them. It's called Enzyme as well. That helps with testing React components. So 
So you see his TypeScript. It's looking up the component you saw before. It knows these are the properties. Hint text, on change, complete, and on change. So I can just enter them directly. And let's put the other ones on the next line. So what this has done now, function from the Enzyme library, which is used for testing React. Component, and essentially mounting it onto a fake DOM. We want this to have an input component, so we can say, component.find, an input, that uses um, jQuery-like commands. And because we actually want to Here, I'm going to check. Once I've done a search for all inputs, the length is one. So I found one component that's a type input. Other ways to do this test as well. What we've started doing, because often your components will have hundreds of inputs. But what I did for a while was add CSS classes to components. So I'd say dot find things with input class. We did that for a while. I didn't really like that. It's my CSS namespace. So what have I actually started doing? Oops. Is that. So on the input field itself, have a data tag with a value in it. The reason I use the data tag instead of something else like field identifier, if you have unknown tags in the React rendering, so if I put an unknown tag on that div, React will print out some console warnings when it renders the component warnings. So we went to having using the data tag, which React understands. In any case, here, cool. So in theory, if I run this test now, of course, this text is just a little bit small to see. Uh, I've set up, in this case, Jasmine or Karma to automatically do the TypeScript compilation. Basically, it started PhantomJS in the background. It's told me it can't find variable React in my component because I forgot to import it. This was one of the things when I started doing JavaScript program, I love programming I loved the most because I can do that, save it, and it auto-watches and reruns my tests. So it contains an input components failed. If you can read this at the back, you've got damn good eyesight. Expected zero to equal one. Zero, our length. We wanted one, it gave us zero. So in the component, Add and cross my fingers, now the test passing. Day to day. Write the test, get it failing, get it passing.
I think writing all those six tests would probably take too long. They're all kind of similar. What I might do, though, is write a behavioral one. Who here has seen spies or mocks in test code before? Most of us. Who? Anyone not? So a spy or a mock or a test double or there's any number of ways to describe them that no one quite seems to have a good definition on is a piece of code, a function that you can watch and see how it's called. Mocks some bit of code that you don't want to test. Responses. So here for this test, calls the on change prop when text is changed, I'm going to create a, a spy on change function. And then copy my component. What did I do wrong then? I didn't copy the whole thing. So here, an on change. So I've created a spy, rendered my component, passing in the spy for that method that's going to be called. Now, Enzyme gives us a way to simulate DOM events. So we find the input field. We know it exists because of the structural test. By having both those two tests, I know that if this one fails and the top one doesn't, it's the behavior. If the top one's failing as well, then there's something wrong with my structure. So it lets me focus down on where the issue is. It took me ages to figure out the right syntax for events in Enzyme. That's something I just had to Google. Dot keyboard event class, but I find it misses some of the important things. Simulating a change event, the text input is saying, I've now changed to the keyword blah, or the word blah. And after that change has happened, I expect my on change to have been called with that keyword. Which, of course, is failing at the moment. It expects the on change prop to be called when the text has changed. The on change to have been called with blah, but it was never called. So the error is telling me exactly what's gone wrong. And here, probably won't like what I'm about to do. So it's a good opportunity to bring it up. React, when it renders a component, it produces the, a virtual DOM. When a component gets re-rendered later because something's changed, it compares the two. If you pass in what I've done here, um, a function that's bound, the two DOMs will be different because the bindings happen on rendering. Render it. I think that's right, eh? Much better to bind it in the constructor or do something else like that. And 
And there's the on-chain handler written. Yes, so any is kind of cheating, which means I have no idea what this is, so pretend it's anything. If you've got an object in TypeScript or any, any, anything that TypeScript thinks is a type, you can assign something of type any to it. It bypasses all the type magic. So it's a little bit dangerous, but in this case, it's kind of easier. Technically, I could say react.keyboard event. But for some reason, react.keyboard event, the TypeScript definition for that I've got doesn't include the value part of it uh, for this method. So you can do this, which my code seems to look like a lot. Event.target is any dot value. So as any takes event.target, casts it to any, pretends it's any, and then calls dot value on it. And sometimes with libraries, definitions of them aren't quite complete. So you do end up with ugly workarounds. Or you make your own TypeScript definition instead of react.keyboard event and use it instead of. Does that just react with the easy flow and promoting flow? I honestly have no idea. And the tests have passed. Is that clear as mud? I've got all the code in a GitHub repository, so if anyone wants to look at it afterwards, I'll, um, the completed component, if I go to my sample solution, looks a little bit different. Well, it's just bigger, because I'm capturing things like the enter event. So you can type press enter, and then that causes bit of the field. And I'm using a funny font that turns triple equals into a kind of nice triple equals. Fero? Hmm? Fero, Fero code, yeah, Fero code. So does that make sense as a really quick how to test drive, how to TypeScript, how to React? They tend to fit together really well. And the auto-completion is just outstanding. IntelliJ um, is my IDE in case you want to know. WebStorm is IntelliJ as well. It's just WebStorm only does web development. Another thing I really like about Jasmine, and this may be true of Mokuro Kai as well, is you can actually bundle up all of your tests in Jasmine and make them accessible through your website. So here, I've started up so I can go to the local host and it'll run the tests in my browser. Which means if you've got 800-ish tests development version of our app, you can run all your unit tests with all the components in the browser in their environment with their plugins. And if one fails, it means you've likely found the issue that they're bugging you about. And I find that really powerful. Because you never quite... Hmm? Hmm? The talking or the running? OK. So this is our, not production, our development or test app at the moment from work. I've got 894 unit tests for the front end. What I've done is I've bundled all those up and deployed them with the app. So if I go to my app URL, slash tests, it loads up Jasmine and runs all the tests in my browser. Or rather, if one of my customers is having an issue that isn't making sense, they're saying they're getting weird errors and nothing's working, I can tell them to go to this URL and have all my unit tests run in their browser. So if their browser doesn't support some weird variant of something I'm using, or if one of the plugins they've got has broken something, it's likely one of the unit tests will fail, and I'll know exactly where to look to start with. Say again? We don't have production yet, so I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> I'll get them to run it. Jasmine prints out in bright red which ones fail. 
I'll probably get them to do a print screen or just a save as. It's likely if I'm asking someone to do this as well, I'll be using remote desktop to look at their computer. That's the component we just did with its two tests passing and its other four tests not yet written. Any other questions about that? About the coding side of it? Yeah. Um, framework, the more I can do pure TDD. When I was starting, I had to spend time writing the component, seeing how it debugged out, understanding enzyme, and having that iterative thing. And that's kind of normal when you don't know to write things that seem kind of simple in retrospect. Like, um, actually, none of them seem kind of simple in retrospect. Even just mounting a component took time to figure out how to do. And so the most useful thing I found was this command. <laughs> Gives you a nice print of the component. What I have found, though, is if I'm juggling lots of properties and lots of state, that's a big indication to me. My component's too big, and I should really start splitting it into subcomponents. Did yep. You oh. like Jest before you with Karma? Or? Before I went with Karma, no. Um, <laughs> um, I've heard good things about Jest. I haven't used it. I know with Jasmine, there's actually a Jasmine um, library that links them really well. So you can say component.find input. Oh, I have five minutes. Um, component.find input exists. There's something you can write there which makes it a bit easier. Because I've only got a couple of minutes, I might just go through this really quickly. I've got a whole lot of slides on it that we won't do. So this box here is all of my React components. With a single page web app, you need a whole lot more than just the view, which is what React gives you. Here for the state, so um, what page is being shown, what customer data there is, what invoices we've received. We've used a library called Redux for that. We also cache data from the server. So those are also, for a single page app, two really important things. React doesn't do that page-wide state particularly well. And another library like Redux is really good. Translation service, every bit of text in our app goes through this, so we can change the language and have it appear in a different language. Translated to English and not particularly well right now. But that gives us that future proofing for going global. Doing that at the beginning, then at the end. I wrote it myself. It's a class, it's got one method called translate, and it has a file with lots of properties in it. There probably are lots of libraries you can use, but it wasn't hard to write. The hard part was um, the data. You have lots of async operations happening in a single page app. You're always going to the server, requesting more data, sending updates, and doing lots of other things. But part of the code that's just responsible for asynchronous operations. The view decides to, for example, I don't know, approve an invoice for payment. The controller is responsible for first displaying an overlay saying approving payment. 
then sending the data off to our router, which talks to the Lambda services or the server or whatever you've got on the back end. Then it's responsible for handling any errors coming back, removing the overlay, displaying dialog boxes, and updating the state. There is some middleware you can use that kind of sits just beside Redux, with Redux quite nicely. We don't use that because I didn't know about it until after I wrote that class. But whether you integrate it with sort of a Redux middleware layer or has something else, it's really handy to have all that asynchronous code in one spot. Because your views shouldn't really know that if it's approving an invoice, then overlays have to be shown and all these other rules. This rule logic out of there. Um, a router to make calls to the server. Change your server, how it's structured. And really importantly for us, what we've done is we've switched out our router so that we've got a proof of concept system online. The router just responds with dummy data. So suddenly our system can be used in proof of concept or demo mode, doesn't talk to the server at all. And production code is everywhere else. And authentication as well. I'm still in two minds whether an authentication service and the router are two different things or one. But having that separation of talking to the server from the rest of your code is really powerful. That's probably my five minutes up, eh? Give you one. Okay. Oh, that's right. Two things missing from here that I'm going to start implementing soon. A whole lot of business rules. The state separate from the view and separate from everywhere else. That started to evolve with something that I need to have somewhere. And environment configuration, so your router knows and other good things like that that are starting to appear in our design that we're probably going to say, actually, this is now separate, and pull those things in there. But space till 8 o'clock. Um, the discussion will continue at the Hop Garden if you all want to mosey on down that way, but um, thanks to all of our sponsors, thanks to the Biz Dojo, thanks to Clara Wellington, thanks to all of the, the helpers of the JavaScript meetup. If you want to help out, um, come talk to myself or Ryan. Um, if you want to talk, same thing. Uh, if you have ideas for talk, same thing. Basically, we love that this community is the way that it is. We want to see it grow and prosper, so please just chat to us about anything. It's awesome. Thanks again for coming, um, and yeah, and for future discussions of JS stuff. Thanks. Yeah.